Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is category theory. Today I would like to talk about a subcategory or substructures or as we will see symmetric groups and cobordisms, which is kind of a really nice example of a, of a subcategory. So what is a subcategory? Well, we'll see the abstract definition, but you should just think about it as follows. Whenever you study a certain type of structure, you should think about types of substructures, right? So you like to study molecules, you're a chemist and you like to study molecules. So you should think about certain types of substructures like uh, submolecules and sort of atoms or whatever, right? And it's kind of the setup that we uh, see right now here and it's everywhere in mathematics. If you study groups, you should consider subgroups, if, which would be the correct notion of a sub, uh, substructure in groups. If you study whatever vector spaces, you could, should consider subvector spaces, which is a correct structure of a substructure of a, in vector spaces, and so on. This is really just a tiny bunch of examples, right? We kind of fix um, this idea of, well, you want to see substructures because very often you can actually realize something as a substructure of a nicer category, for example, um, a subcategory of a nicer category. We'll see an example of that, not in this video, but in one of the uh, next videos. Um, but right now, just to get started with some ideas here. So something I haven't explained in any of the previous videos, but this which is pretty cool idea of think about it, a cool way of thinking about it, is that categories also generalize groups. So in what sense do categories generalize groups? So take your favorite group. So here I have a Z mod two and here I have a Z mod four and I call the corresponding category Z mod two cut and Z mod four cut. But in general, it just works as follows. The, the, the G cut, so G is a fixed group and the category associated to it has just one object, just a stupid point, right? We have just one object, just give it the name bullet. It's just a stupid point. And it has a lot of morphisms and the morphisms are exactly the elements of the group. So G, H, whatever, I don't know what comes after H, you know? And composition is multiplication in the group. That's group as a category, right? A group is nothing else than a, one point category, not quite a monoid is nothing else than a one point category because you don't have any requirements on um, uh, invertibility. But anyway, let's just think about groups for now. So a group is a one point category. So actually, the if this philosophy actually gets us further, right? So then we should be able to see subgroups in terms of categories. And this is how it works. So here is a, maybe a slightly nicer example to kind of forget this one for a second. Uh, so a slightly nicer example, this one as well. So uh, Z mod two cut, no? Z mod two has two elements. And in my slightly strange notation, I note, denote them zero and two. You will see in a second why. There are just two arrows along that point, right? So and, uh, multiplication in this case is just addition modulo four. You will see in a second why I would like it to be modulo four. Of course, you could also just do maybe the more classical one, uh, zero and one, and uh, multiplication or co composition is addition mod two. Um, but the reason I would like to have it like Z mod four, uh, modulo four, is I have my mod four category uh, where also the composition is given uh, mod four addition. And of course I have four arrows here, zero, one, two, and three. Um, and I want to see the top one as a subcategory, as a substructure of the bottom one. And it's just easier if I just label my arrows zero and two, right? So it kind of, it's exactly the substructure given by those subsets of arrows. So what's so nice about the substructure? Well, it certainly is uh, contained in the objects, right? So there's just one object. The arrows are contained in the arrows. Very good. And it's composition close, right? That's what you observe here. And in this case, the Z mod two category is a substructure of the Z mod four category. So let's have a look at another example. This is kind of an example of a subcategory, maybe a little bit of a strange one, but if you like groups, then this is actually pretty good because this is just saying that the, your favorite notion about groups seem to be reflected in categories, which is pretty good because it's kind of saying that categories are a generalization of groups. I'm not saying in general that you just should instead of studying groups by themselves, you should always study categories. That probably doesn't work. It gets too abstract in some sense. Taking a bird's eye point of view doesn't always help, but it's certainly a nice perspective to keep in your mind. But groups are actually a special case of categories. Okay, uh, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's not study a specific group, but let's look at the category of groups. 
right? By category group, um, objects are well groups, and morphisms are group of morphisms, right? And I have an associated category of monoids. So monoid is just the same as a group, just drop the invertibility. So here's an example of a group. Uh, Z mod six, this addition is a group. And an F here would be some F between Z mod six. And here's an example of a monoid. Z mod six, this product is actually a monoid. Um, there's a certainly an element zero, for example, is not really invertible in, in the product, but also three is also not invertible in the product. So it's just a monoid. Anyway, so um, you can have a functor, which I call the subfunctor, from green, from the green category group on the left to the red category monoid on the right. And it just sends every group to its associated monoid, because of course, every group is a monoid. And every group homomorphism is a monoid homomorphism. So in that sense, groups are a subset of monoids. And it kind of makes sense, right? They're a substructure of monoids. The category of groups is the substructure of the category of monoids. And this kind of makes sense, as I said, because, well, groups are just monoids with an extra axiom. So there should be some kind of way to go from the category of groups to the category of monoids. And it's just a very easy uh, way of going there. It's a substructure in the correct way of sense of substructure. And again, it's kind of the same flavor. Every object here is sent to some object here. Note that you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. There are, there are monoids that are not groups. I'm not saying every object on the right-hand side comes from an object on the left-hand side, right? I'm just saying every object on the left-hand side goes to an object on the right-hand side. And same for morphisms. So every morphism here goes to a morphism. Okay, so let's have a look at a non-set based example. So um, my one crop category, uh, objects in my one crop category are those funny pictures. So I just draw them from bottom. Uh, so our objects are just natural numbers. So here two, uh, four, I can't count. And here four, for example. And uh, well, this is a bad example. Let's say four and six. Uh, so I have six boundary points, I have four boundary points and everything I can draw between them um, just in this line type fashion uh, so I could put a circle here, for example, as well, that counts as a cobaltism. Uh, that's a morphism in the category. So here's another example. It goes from three, three to five, five, and it's just this picture. And composition is given by stacking of pictures. And there's a nice subcategory, which I call symmetric, symmetric subcategory. It's a symmetric group, which are just all pictures without any, any cups or caps, right? So we don't want cups or caps here. Just, and, and consequently, we don't have any circles, right? Because we, we don't want to draw cups or caps. Um, so for example, here's an element from five to five. Right? So five, I hope I didn't miscount, to five. Very good. So this is a subcategory. And actually, if you think about it a little bit, this is a very nice category. It contains all symmetric groups at once. I won't comment on that any further, but it's a category that contains all symmetric groups. And it's obviously a substructure because I can just send well, five to five uh, or whatever, n to n on level of objects. And every morphism on the right hand, left hand side makes sense as a morphism on the right hand side. Every arrow on the left hand side makes sense as an arrow on the right hand side. So this is again, a type of structure, a little bit different from all the others, but in principle, just what you do is you send objects to objects and uh, arrows to arrows and everything should be kind of nicely, there should be no squeezing. You don't want to identify uh, straight arrows to be the same if they're not the same before. So here it's clearly not the case. So it's clearly injective on arrows. Same here, it's injective on arrows, right? The map is just determined, uh, a morphism here is just determined as a map and it, you just don't change the map setup. So this is just stay injective on, uh, on arrows. And this gives us a definition already. Um, so C is called a subcategory of D, a substructure. So what could we want? Let's think about what could we want. Well, it should be a sub on objects. It should be a sub on arrows. That's what it should be, right? And that's that's basically the definition. Yeah, it should be a sub on objects and a sub on arrows. Um, not quite because we had two other axioms for a category, which also should be preserved. So the relevant identity should be all in uh, all in the image um, for C, and the relevant composition should work. So it should be closed and it should should be unitary if you want. There should be units. And then you could come up with some definitions, uh, for example, uh, dense, uh, if it's dense on objects. So if for every object in C, there exists kind of an object in D, right? So 
examples from the three examples from before. So those are dense. So here I just send end to end. So it's kind of boring. So every object, the so objects are matched bijectively. That's okay, by the way, not what I assume. Objects don't need to match bijectively, right? But here in the Zmo2 category, I just said point to point. So objects are also perfectly matched bijectively. But note that here this is not the case because, for example, the Zmo6 example with multiplication is an object that you just don't see under the image of the, of the from, from groups of the sub substructure from groups. So it's not dense. And similarly, it's full, right? It's already injective on objects. So you might ask whether it's surjective on objects. Um, and for example, this is not full, obviously not. So let's have a look. Uh, this picture, for example, does not come from here. So this can't be full. Um, here, this arrow doesn't come, this is three arrow doesn't come from here, so it can't be full. The last one, if you think about it, the third one or the second one, whatever, if you think about it a little bit, actually is full um, because between groups, the notion of a group homomorphism is just the same as the notion of a monoid homomorphism. So this is actually a full, a full embedding. Okay. Um, and I would like to address a few more properties here, which I call reflective or which I don't call reflective, which is called reflective. And it's kind of this idea of completion. We will come back to that later and when we see adjoint functors. But for now, it's just the following idea. So um, here's a property that determines whether a morphism is reflective. So I've chosen arrow here from Y to X, and I call it reflective if the following well, universal type of property holds. So for every F to an X prime, this is this arrow here. You will you will have an exactly one way to fill up the triangle. That's what's, what's universal. Me just means there's exactly one way to fill up the corresponding uh, shape you see. Um, that's what's called reflexive. And uh, well, the buff here is just called whatever it is, a C reflection of Y. And the kind of the notion you can you can study here. So the point is here. I would like to vary a little bit what could be a nice subcategory. And what I would like to see here is a reflective subcategory. And it's just a subcategory where everything has has reflections. And here are some examples. So, for example, uh, kind of nice examples: compact uh, compact matrix spaces in matrix spaces, and the reflection is completion. Uh, commutative groups in groups, and the reflection is a commutator. Uh, kind of nice. So, kind of reflections should generalize the notion of completions, if you want, or of quotients. Um, we'll come back to those later, as I said. There's a very, very nice uh, categorical way to express those reflective subcategories. This was just an example uh, that you can actually play around with the notions a little bit, and you could generalize something like a completion, which is pretty cool, right? You could generalize something like completing a matrix space, which I personally like a lot. Anyway, so subcategories are kind of this generalization of subgroups, if you want. Uh, so the great correct notion of substructures in categories. So that's certainly an important notion, and we'll see uh, in later talks that actually there's a very nice way to make it work kind of for all categories. So all categories are subcategories of a nice category if you want. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.